we want to talk now about in competition. Uh, while in competition and emotions are involved in self-control, what does that look like for both coaches, players, or even fans? Again, we're talking about different categories of the inner and outer inner circle and the outer circle. Inner circle, again, is players and coaches, managers, trainers within the context of the team. The way you know who's in that room is that at the end of the game, when the coach pulls his team together, whether it's on the field or a locker room, who's in that circle? It's players, it's coaches, it's, it's not fans, right? It's not parents generally. It's going to be managers and trainers, support personnel of the, of the particular participation or the contest. And the outer circle is everybody else. So even though they're family, might be parents, they're, they're still in the outer circle because they're not in that locker room. The family, the friends, the spectators who don't have ties to players, this is part of the outer circle. Everybody beyond that is part of the outer circle in addition. So what does it look like within competition of self-control when emotion is involved? When emotion, for instance, when something doesn't go your way, you make a mistake, you make a public mistake, you make a bad play, you make a great play. It could be both something that happens negatively or happens positively. One thing we notice as those that have been in sports is how much, and you see this on the TV, how much has become drawn attention to self as players in particular in competition. It's, it's like every time there's a play that's good, somebody has to act it out, so to speak, and draw attention to themselves, which is in conflict to our philosophy because we're trying to draw attention to God and to the team, others, not attention to ourselves. That is in conflict with our current culture, in particular regarding players. And that's something we address within our programs about what we want it to look at because we don't want to steal from the glory of God and we don't want to steal from the glory of sport, uh, uh, the glory of team. The, when I say glory, I'm saying that we want, we want it to be about team and not about me. And we want it to be about the sport and not this particular season. And so in all these ways, we're always trying to think with a longer view and a bigger view of things. So in particular, what happens and how do we address that issue? Well, first of all, we're talking about education. So with your team, again, whether they're six-year-olds or they're 20-year-olds or they're professional, or even as we say, we talk about other kinds of competition. It's about having conversations with interactions that we're trying to work with those who either haven't been educated in how we approach these things. And then, of course, in the midst of both practice and game, and even in, in off-season workouts, there's all kinds of opportunities to address the issue of self-control. Now, self-control is, is one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. It's one of the fruits or results of being connected to the vine. It's one of the nine fruits that's mentioned is a supernatural fruit or result of walking in the Spirit or being filled with the Spirit. And thus, for players who can exercise their will to energize the self-control that the Holy Spirit gives. It's a partnership between our will and the Spirit of God to where we can either quench the Spirit or we can allow the Spirit to flow through us in terms of self-control. And this is a big thing in sports, uh, not only because it protects you from embarrassing yourself or drawing attention to yourself, it also allows you to align with God for His glory or for the building up of others to bless them, including the opponent. This would be an example of in our context, if an opponent made a great play, for instance, we would encourage them. Great job, nice catch, good tackle. We wouldn't think about trying to beat them. We're thinking about being a man of God or a woman of God or being, if you're not, if this isn't a spiritual thing, if you're in a secular climate or you're dealing with unbelievers, it's about the way we want to honor and respect our opponent, which is affirming them. That is contrary to the world's way, which is you want to tear them down, embarrass them, or steal from them. That is not what we see in the Spirit of God. That's our opinion. And so we talk about these things because when they come into your program, whether, again, it's a youth team or a junior high team, uh, or whether it's a high school team, a professional team, if this is what you're going to stick to as a philosophy, then there has to be an education. There's an education piece that precedes the action. There's an information piece and an interaction piece that goes on and then there's an observation piece, and then there's an implementation piece, as we talked about in the previous clips. And so how does one move the ball forward philosophically in this philosophy with actual players as we educate? And then, and then they observe. We model it. We model self-control as coaches. Players model self-control as they embrace it. 
We watch other teams either execute self-control or the opposite of self-control. We show the ramification and the results. I know in a football setting that when another team's player loses control and gets a penalty because of loss of self-control and it affects the outcome of the game, that ends up being a very educational moment for to understand this is why when you get pushed or hit, you don't push or hit back. Because if you get caught, you can get kicked out or we'll have a penalty or the game, the team will be compromised within that principle when if one person goes sideways on a team with 10 or 100, everybody loses. When one person gets a penalty for loss of self-control, all 10 or 20 or 100 players are impacted by that one person's loss of self-control because his emotion got the best of him. These are educational moments that happen in the classroom, then they happen in practice when it's not even the competitive game experience. When you're just practicing, these opportunities exist where somebody has to use self-control, where he's offended, or he's hurt, or he's angry, or he's embarrassed, or he has success and wants to draw attention himself, and he wants to embarrass a teammate who he just beat on the play or succeeded over. However you view this, this happens in the practice setting, in the game setting, it happens in the locker room. It happens when you use sarcasm, which never ends up well. It happens when you're just joking around. It happens all the time. These are educational moments to learn to use self-control among other fruits of the spirits, but this is the one we're talking about right now. It's learning to submit to authority. Players submit to the coach's authority. I asked my players when I was coaching to exhibit certain behaviors and not exhibit, exhibit certain behaviors, even if that was their personal conviction. Meaning they may feel like when I played there or when I used to play, this is what I did or could do. And I'm saying, I hear you, but now you're here. And so in our little family, in our community, in this little country, this is how we walk. This is how we talk. This is how we direct, uh, dress. This is how we respond. Here's how we act. And it's, and it's within our rights as overseers or authority figures to ask that because sport teams are voluntary organizations. Nobody makes somebody play in them and nobody makes somebody coach of them in general, with, with rare exceptions I'm not even going to ponder or articulate. And so people choose to become part of this community where these boundaries and these guidelines are present. And so they learn submission to authority, which allows them to learn how to treat their parents. My relationship with my parents, who are now deceased, was transformed by this philosophy. I grew up as a, as a proud, arrogant, young athlete with uh, my, my parents were hand off, hands off, which probably was wise because I would have resisted and rebelled more aggressively than I did. But when I played in this philosophy and learned or was taught about being kind and compassionate and serving and, and saying, not my will, but yours be done, I had a conviction of sinning against my parents, of not submitting to their authority, of being proud and rebellious, and I repented of them. And frankly, my relationship of my first 21 years in particular during the junior high and high school years and early in college was adversarial. And then because of this philosophy of sport and the transformation it brought in my life and lifestyle, my relationship with my parents was reconciled and redeemed. And thankfully, they lived another 35 years after my college days. So after losing years because of my ignorance, the Lord in his graciousness gave him back to me because he redeemed them because of the revelation of my sin, conviction of it by the Holy Spirit, all of which was learned through sport. I learned about submission to authority to God through submitting to the authority of man, which then impacted the submission of authority to my parents and transformed my family life. These are all part of the fruit of this philosophy that then impacts families. That fruit of the Holy Spirit comes by the Spirit of God, whether people are unbelievers or not. They may not have the Spirit in them. They're not born again. They may not be walking in the Spirit. They are born again, but not walking. They may not be filled with the Spirit. Nonetheless, these are boundaries and guidelines that we mandate within our programs when we want to be biblical about the way we play and coach, the way we articulate, the way we deal in the inner circle and the outer circle. Remind you, this can be done when submitted to the Spirit of God. When submitted not to the Spirit of God, 
when not under the control of the Holy Spirit or having a desire for that, then when emotion comes up, people won't more often exercise self-control. They'll stop certain behaviors because they don't want to get a penalty, but they want to learn the lesson about how that can impact their life. They won't transfer. There won't be transformational so that their marriage and their family can be impacted because they're talking about behavior modification instead of internal transformation, which then impacts the behavior of the people. And when the inside changes, the outside then changes also in time. And to the degree that the inside changes with that force, to that degree the application occurs. Sport is the teacher of all this. And learning in the midst of a public setting and a competition when emotions are high because there's public loss, public failure, public success, this becomes transformational and it becomes impactful in all areas of life. This is the benefit of this philosophy in regards to self-control and dealing with emotions.